Hey everyone, hi everyone. Uh, shall we start? Great. Uh, awesome. Great. Awesome. I think uh, all of you, thanks for joining. Um, I see that some some of them have troubles joining, but uh, finally you are there. Uh, awesome. So uh, let me start with a quick introduction about myself and uh, what I'm going to talk about in today's presentation. Um, in fact, let me share my video as well. So I hope you can see me. Uh, Awesome. Uh, so today I'll be covering a topic related to ML observability. Uh, given that uh, you know there is a lot of attention around uh, AI safety and uh, deploying AI uh, in a responsible manner, um, but uh, I guess these things are very fundamental to any product, right? So when you are building something, uh, people expect that uh, there is enough due diligence on the product uh, and before it goes live, uh, particularly when it comes to high risk use cases. Uh, but the problem is today, there is a tremendous amount of focus around model manufacturing, uh, meaning the, there is a lot of intention to publish models uh, because of which uh, maybe little to no attention is given around uh, what can go wrong or what are the things that is required uh, to make it live um, and acceptable uh, by all the users. So one of the layer that could actually uh, uh, democratize this or uh, make this happen at scale is ML observability. So currently, you know, we have been hearing about MLOps, right? Which is the horizontal MLOps uh, tools, uh, which handles tasks from uh, data preparation to uh, model retraining, uh, model productionization, and re retraining in uh, production. Uh, ML observability typically sits on top of that. Sometimes or many times, currently it's part of the MLOps, uh, but it has its own independent role with a larger purpose. Uh, so that's what I'm going to discuss today. So today I'll briefly touch upon uh, what are the uh, you know how how do we define the ML observability? What is the need of it? Uh, what are the components that would be required uh, for a good ML observability kind of uh, product? Um, a, a good reference is you know today you already have software observability tools right from uh, Datadog uh, to Neuralic for example. These are very well established uh, software ML observability tool. Uh, sorry, software observability tools. Uh, if AI is a new software, wouldn't AI also require an, uh, an observability tool, right? Uh, it actually can borrow a lot of principles in terms of how software observability works. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, to that uh, ML observability requires additional layers as well. Uh, so we'll discuss that uh, as well. So when it comes to deploying AI in uh, sensitive use cases, um, as I said, for example, let's say sensitive use cases like financial services or healthcare or autonomous cars, manufacturing, for example, I cannot simply use a model as a product. A uh, model is part of the product and the product requires a lot more layers uh, before it can become usable for these kind of use cases. And in fact, uh, probably soon enough, uh, very, very soon. So you would require to apply these uh, layers as part of the regulation. So for example, in Europe, you already have AI Act, uh, which is supposed to come uh, very uh, well, uh, as early as next year, uh, which talks about what kind of uh, layers that have to be added for uh, high risk use cases, for medium risk use cases and low risk use cases. Some of those uh, layers are categorized into these five buckets. So first is the transparency, uh, meaning whenever you are productionizing a model, uh, it has to be uh, uh, explainable, transparent to the end user, so that the user can understand how the model has functioned in this case. Uh, I think this is very fundamental. Uh, it's not uh, anything add-on that would be required, but somehow it has been missing uh, uh, in, in the AI ML, many AI ML products today. Uh, but uh, if you're deploying it for high-risk use cases, they cannot deploy based on the prediction only, right? It, they need to have additional uh, explainability such that they can validate, okay, you know, this is how the model has worked. Probably this makes sense. Uh, hence, uh, they can use those predictions. So second bucket is the bonded risk. What it means is when I use uh, these models in production, uh, particularly if I'm in, using it for high-risk use cases, I should be aware about what are the risks associated with it. So for example, I'm using it for autonomous cars. So I need to know when it can go wrong, how it can go wrong, so that uh, I, I would be aware about what kind of controls or guardrails that I need to build, right? Uh, it cannot be a case where I'm putting something in production and I don't know what is the risk of those uh, uh, models in production. 
Uh, so for example, uh, another example could be, you know, using it for underwriting, for example, which is a very common use case today, right? So let's say I built a model and I'm using it in production. Um, the model uh, sometimes fails uh, maybe more often than what we think of. Uh, then how do I manage uh, the errors of these uh, uh, errors of these models, right? Uh, uh, so it has to be a bounded uh, uh, risk uh, in some way or the other, or else uh, it cannot be an uncapped risk. Uh, then uh, uh, the high high risk use cases will be very very. Uh, uh, risk averse and may not use these models in production. So the third thing is third is promised SLAs, uh, which is primarily talks about model performance, consistency, and reliability. Uh, meaning, uh, let's say I built a model during uh, uh, in, in uh, production with an accuracy almost ninety eight percent, but within a one month, two months time period, the accuracy dropped down to around eighty percent. So that's not a reliable product or a solution. Uh, this happens primarily if you don't test it enough, or if you have uh, if you have built an overfit model, uh, uh, particularly on uh, certain data, uh, then you may see uh, higher accuracies in a shortened time period of production usage. But soon after, uh, you would find a model drift or a data drift, and uh, that can impact the model performance very, very drastically, uh, which can uh, uh, result in again model degradation and uh, inconsistencies in the model. And the fourth thing is the auditability. So, for example, I have given a prediction for, again, let's say uh, a doctor diagnosis, right? A medical diagnosis. Something went wrong. Uh, there could be loss of life, or there could be uh, a damage to the life or the business. For example, uh, then uh, there there will be an external parties involved, maybe from external or internal. So it could be regulator involving uh, to do a lot of due diligence on why it has happened. Or maybe the internal teams themselves wants to do due diligence and audit on uh, these transactions. Uh, it, uh, if if there is no, if there is not enough auditability, then accountability cannot be established, right? Uh, for example, model failed. Then who is the reason behind it, or what is, what process failure is the reason behind it? Uh, if it cannot be retraced back to that uh, accountability, uh, then again, uh, uh, you know, so it it cannot be a seamless use of uh, AI. Uh, it just becomes a chaotic, you know, blame games. Uh, uh, he and she, and those kind of uh, scenarios comes into play uh, if there is not enough auditability in the uh, in the solution. And fifth is compliant. Uh, as of now, it's not needed by regulations. Uh, so good, but again, very bad uh, from an ecosystem perspective because anything and everything is now going live. But uh, regulations are now very very uh, coming soon, quite quickly. Uh, and in fact, this week, last week, there has been a huge amount of buzz around uh, AI governance, uh, from uh, the White House hearing to uh, uh, you know day before yesterday, uh, the statements made by all these AI players uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, there have been more uh, stringent discussions around AI Act. So regulations are coming in very quickly. Uh, in fact, those regulations are actually talking about these five layers itself. Uh, the depth of it could vary between geography to geography. Uh, which means that soon uh, you have to be compliant. Uh, uh, the product, the module has to adhere to these guidelines given by the uh, local or uh, uh, international regulators from that point of view. So these are the five components that have to be uh, used uh, when uh, uh, when you are deploying the model uh, in uh, production. Now let's uh, understand and dig a little bit deep dive into the models itself, right? So from a reliability standpoint, you know, so can the models fail? Uh, in reality, uh, you you uh, you may not, uh, uh, or at least there is a lot of uh, 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 assumption that when they uh, when they put a model in production, the model uh, remain consistently giving the similar kind of accuracies. Uh, but in reality, as I said, so you could be actually uh, seeing a lot of degradation, maybe fast degradation or slow degra degradation, uh, depending upon the model transactions and all of it. Uh, but uh, the model performance will keep on coming down. So if you continue to use the model for a very long time, right? Uh, now let's understand the reason behind this. Uh, in fact, there was a paper published uh, around six months back, I guess, uh, which talks about the temp uh, temporal degradation of uh, uh, AI models. So what they have done is they have done close to uh, 20,000 plus experiments uh, with multiple combinations of data and modeling types. Uh, when they try to observe using the model for a longer time periods, uh, they observe that uh, more than 91% of the models uh, degraded over time. So they plotted the error rates and error rate distribution from time to time. So they have seen that the error rate distribution is quite uh, sparse, uh, quite disperse actually. 
uh, as 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 uh, it as, uh, with the time actually. So it's making more errors and more diverse errors as compared to initially where it's making a smaller amount of errors or very uh, uh, you know uh, small kind of uh, errors from that standpoint. So we have done a quick uh, analysis as well. Uh, we have picked up actually a lending club data sets. Um, that's one of the marquee data sets when you are building an underwriting model. So uh, lending club data has uh, data from 2007, uh, 2020. So you have close to 13 years of data, right? So what we have done is we picked up the data uh, with a different time periods and uh, trained the model on those time periods and tested on the remaining time period. So for example, uh, we have trained the model on 2017 to 2014 uh, and then tested it on the remaining years, which is 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, the remaining uh, five, six, uh, six years. Uh, likewise, we trained the model between 2007 to 2015 and tested on remaining uh, five years uh, like that. So we have trained the model uh, on a certain time period and tested on the remaining time period. When we observe this, the latest model actually had better performance as compared to the oldest model for the entire time period. Uh, this could be a simple correlation, uh, but the same effect can be seen more drastically in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, when you productionize these models. So uh, the reason is multifold actually why this uh, degradation uh, uh, happens. Uh, it could be as uh, it could be things like, for example, data drift and concept drift. So, uh, data drift is primarily, uh, you know, so you have trained the model on uh, data type A, whereas in production you are uh, you are seeing data which the model is not trained on. Maybe the boundaries have changed, the metrics has changed, uh, new variables, new parameters have been introduced. Uh, then the model may not have enough knowledge on how to correlate those new data points. So that's primarily data drift. And then concept drift is uh, when the target of the model itself could be changing, maybe because of the uh, uh, reality of the process. So for example, a very easy example is actually the COVID uh, time period. Uh, for a profile A uh, of a customer, uh, maybe it was an acceptable risk for, let's say, an insurer. Uh, but the same profile A, because of maybe various of uh, external factors, uh, the same profile A, the same input, uh, uh, now uh, they want to take a different kind of uh, outcome. So then the model may not aware about these target changes, uh, then it, can, uh, it, it leads to target drift and the model degradation uh, as well. Uh, so this is a simple visual representation, uh, representation that k dimension guys have done. So it looks very easy to understand. Uh, so original mode of model is you know, data and the target. Uh, when, uh, when there is a tar data drift, it, it tends to do uh, different kind of uh, predictions. Uh, and the concept drift is where the goalpost itself has changed. So, you know, this is a quick way of understanding uh, uh, data drift and uh, uh, concept drift. Concept drift is also called as target drift or model drift. It's exactly the same. Uh, the target or uh, the model outcome output uh, is now drifting. So is are these hypothetical scenarios? Not at all. Uh, if you are familiar in deploying these models, particularly in high volume, high value transactions, uh, uh, you would you would be aware of these uh, outcomes quite often, uh, quite quickly. Uh, there are some of the examples which are uh, hypothetically uh, the reasons behind that is of uh, these reasons. So, for example, Equifax uh, uh, in uh, uh, last year uh, there was assumed to be a data drift in the model not being observed or not being tracked, uh, which led to model failure or model uh, 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 model failure, uh, where they were giving wrong. Uh, credit scores with a with a change in basis points of almost 25 uh, points uh, for more than 300,000 plus customers. Uh, so this is uh, one of the example where uh, it got PR around this because it's a very large organization and uh, a lot of parties are involved uh, in these transactions. But this could have happened even uh, you know in your case when you productionize the model and you may not be aware about it unless you start monitoring those things. Uh, similarly, in Zillow, there was a target drift. This is can be proven to be a target drift scenario uh, where uh, the prediction models are not aware about uh, the changes in the market uh, are not uh, adapted enough or uh, trained uh, uh, quickly uh, to uh, adapt for that change, uh, which led to wrong set of uh, uh, predictions and wrong set of betting, uh, uh, which leads to you know a, a lot of uh, uh, losses in the business as well. So these are the examples that you could see, and there are many more examples uh, nowadays as well. So where people are talking about uh, you know model failures quite often, 
uh, model failures is also being uh, 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 could could cause a lot of financial and reputational damage as well. So the second problem is uh, bias and fairness, right? So let's assume that uh, you know, so uh, you, you you are deploying this in a regulated use case. Uh, in fact, you already have regulations that you cannot use bias models, uh, particularly in US, for example. Uh, so the typical activity is you would do this as uh, as a one time activity uh, when uh, before productionizing the model, uh, you would look for different matrices like uh, disparity impact ratios or, or TPR difference, TNR difference, those kind of matrices, uh, and figure out if there is any bias uh, in the sensitive uh, data pool. Uh, this is actually a fairly good practice. Uh, but what we have seen is uh, in the same paper that I mentioned earlier, which is temporal poly degradation. Uh, they were tracking the bias uh, metrics as well. So it was observed that uh, the bias is actually changing over time, meaning you may not have um, bias in the model in the beginning, but the bias could be in induced for various reasons over the time period. So this uh, uh, bias and fairness tracking is actually a temporal problem, not a, a fixed event problem. So you may have to start tracking uh, 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 bias and uh, fairness uh, matrices, uh, not just during productionization, but also uh, during production as well. Uh, and and uh, from time to time to figure out if you have any bias in the body. Uh, so one of the classic uh, examples for this was actually the Apple card case study. Um, again, hypothetically, the reason is uh, uh, there was a lot of buzz that uh, Apple card when uh, they launched the uh, uh, card, uh, the underwriting guidelines or principles followed by the model was vast. Uh, it was favoring more towards males as compared to similar profiles uh, for uh, females, for example. It got a lot of negative PR at the time, and uh, regulators also did an audit on those uh, transactions. So the, the conclusion is, you know, if you have biased models and you are using it for a, a high-risk use case, it can evidently become public one time or the other. Uh, and it can not only create a lot of reputation losses, but it, also, it can also create a lot of regulatory challenges as well. Uh, next, third is the uh, transparency and explainability, right? Um, so what happens is, let's say you have spent quite a lot of time to build a model and the model performance is quite good. Um, in fact, let's take the case study of LLMs itself. Uh, the biggest challenge of challenges for LLM adoption is uh, the black box nature of the models. Uh, I'm, I'm taking this as a technique uh, adoption challenge. The technique could have been matured, uh, but unless you have these layers, additional layers, the comfort may not be established to all set of users. Uh, meaning that there could be claims saying that, uh, uh, you know, these LLMs are really good uh, at a certain task A, but the user of, the set, uh, of that task A may not be comfortable because they don't actually understand how the model has worked. Uh, there is not enough auditability around it. There is not enough trust around it. So explainability is actually one of the critical things uh, for a, a universal adoption of AI with confidence and transparency. Uh, so typically your output of the model is something like this. You would have a maybe uh, a, a classification uh, uh, bucket along with a confidence score or some kind of uh, uh, regression output uh, with again, maybe a confidence score or some other kind of metrics. But this is not enough for the user actually, uh, uh, because there are different type of users in these high risk use cases where each of them have different set of questions. So they, let's take the underwriting as an example. Again, uh, the underwriter who is using this output themselves have questions. Forget about uh, the customer, right? The customer would have a bunch of questions, uh, uh, more questions again. Uh, and then when an auditor comes into play, they have a lot more questions as well than on uh, auditability of it, safety of it what went into it, uh, how it has been built on, and all those things. Uh, uh, but net net, even from a model prediction standpoint, all of these uh, stakeholders have different kind of questions. Uh, now, uh, you cannot have one type of explainability or one explainability for all of them. You may have to build templates that address, uh, uh, that, that, that can make it easy for these users to understand the model predictions. Uh, so this is where it's important that what kind of explainability that you are building into the model, uh, and maybe a simple feature importance is not at all enough for all these users because feature importance as an explainability can only work for a certain set of users. And to build a, such explainability, it's quite tough. Uh, uh, you know, it's not easy that uh, we can simply build uh, these explainability templates off the shelf and uh, go live from tomorrow onwards. It requires a lot of efforts and works. 
uh, and that efforts kind of extrapolate uh, if you're using more complex techniques. Uh, you could be using some intrinsically explainable models like XDBMs, for example, or linear regression models. Uh, if you're using those, then it's okay because the models themselves are explainable uh, where you, you would have a starting point, which is uh, the decision tree or, or the feature importance or Shapley values, for example, uh, which you can use to get start and uh, build, uh, uh, build more templates around it. But if you're using uh, techniques like deep learning uh, or RL, for example, it's quite uh, tough to explain those kind of models. Uh, next, fourth one is the auditing part of it. So if you look at the, the, or, the current audit structure, uh, particularly for these high-risk use cases, uh, the stakeholders involved in the auditing are the process owners. Uh, it was always the process owners, right? Uh, uh, like the process owners, uh, like the underwriters or the business owners, for example, uh, or uh, the CFO team or the finance teams. So these are the audiences who are actually involved in the current auditing play. And on the auditing side of things, they have the similar expertise as well. So uh, these are the taxation specialists or the guys who have process specialists to do the you know, auditability of uh, the process and everything. But the question is, if majority of the transactions is going to be handled by AI, so for example, in underwriting, you would have a model which can automate 80% of the transactions, 85% of the transactions. So you, you are looking at a ma massive volume being processed by single entity that is uh, the AI or ML models. Uh, then if you are actually looking to audit the model, it's most important that uh, you are auditing from the model uh, uh, and, and thereby not from the process. Uh, process may not capture the risks that are uh, taken up by the business uh, to execute that business. So AI ML is now a key part of the uh, business continuity and the business risk as well. So uh, then you have to start doing auditing on those things as well. But the problem is, uh, the problems are there in both the business front and the auditing front as well. So businesses do not involve these data science and AI ML teams as of now, at least uh, in a majority of the scenarios, uh, they're not involving the builders of these models, right? Uh, it's primarily the process owners who take the ownership and uh, try to share the information and all. Uh, from the auditing side of things, also they do not have expertise or at least the expertise are now, you know, uh, is, is, is still yet to be built uh, from an auditability standpoint. So this is actually a complex uh, uh, skill set. Uh, um, uh, cross-functional expertise, right? So uh, like you, you should have model building expertise at the same time auditing expertise to figure out what kind of modeling, uh, uh, model auditing has to be done. Uh, so this will be a growing need in the market as we go forward, as AI becomes more mainstream, auditing and auditing, uh, auditability and uh, uh, the skill set to do auditing will become key differentiated. Uh, but net-net, this cannot be possible through a people-driven process because it's going to be a massive time consumption uh, and uh, time spent uh, for delivering these auditability of the systems. You have to look at a, a tool or framework that can deliver this. Uh, and uh, in fact, that's one of the roles what ML observability is supposed to take up. Even doing after all of these things, one of the things that we have seen is, uh, you know, there are ways that people can fool these auditing techniques. So for example, uh, let's say the auditor is using uh, techniques like sharp and line uh, to figure out what was the feature importance and see if the user has used any sensitive features to build the model from a, uh, from a bias and fairness perspective. Uh, the builder might have done scaffolding attacks uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to hide those sensitive features from the auditor. Uh, and auditor may never know that uh, they have actually used uh, the gender, for example, or ethnicity uh, in building these models. So it was actually talked in a paper uh, uh, by uh, uh, published. Uh, so you could read more about uh, these scaffolding attacks on how uh, they can fool uh, sharp and line kind of experimental methods. So even you know achieving auditability is actually not uh, that easy to uh, uh, deliver from an uh, from an ML standpoint. Uh, next fourth thing is the data privacy itself. So, so uh, data privacy is one of the very sensitive topics for everyone, right? Not just to the businesses, but also the users, customers, uh, regulator, uh, regulators, and everyone. Uh, there are clear guidelines uh, there at least, but people have never thought, uh, or at least there is a very less amount of uh, awareness that uh, models can leak data. Uh, uh, so particularly if you're looking at uh, generative AI or synthetic AI models, uh, there is, very high chance that uh, people can attack the models and get the actual data out of these models. Um, you know, you may have heard about stable diffusion where uh, they were using uh, 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 
bookmarked images, uh, Getty images, uh, and people are able to write prompt attacks to get the actual uh, Getty images out of the stable diffusion model, right? Uh, similarly, ChatGPT had a similar uh, uh, case uh, where people have used uh, 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 people have used uh, uh, people have used uh, prompting attacks uh, to figure out uh, how what kind of data has actually went in building those uh, LLMs uh, and uh, do that. And there are other techniques as well. There are techniques like uh, training data poisoning, prompt injection attacks, for example, or uh, 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 inferencing attacks, uh, uh, for example. Uh, so there are all these techniques where people can use uh, to actually get the real data out of the models uh, and uh, uh, sensitive data out of the models. So the, uh, the alternatives, you know, using anonymization of data and building the models on top of the anonymized data but again, the problem is uh, even uh, if you have if you if you have not done anonymization properly, uh, the same uh, uh, there there are uh, there are hacking methods to use those uh, uh, and 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 de-anonymize uh, these data sets. So uh, uh, models are actually uh, uh, now become a very sensitive data leakage uh, source as well. So you have to ensure that you have done uh, enough checks uh, to see that the models are not, uh, uh, you know, hackable or safe uh, and uh, not leaking the data. Um, and then uh, the final, uh, the final uh, problem with AI is, you know, uh, when you build a model, is it qualified to go production? Right. Uh, this is where people will have debates. Uh, okay. So currently, model building is democratized, uh, and it's quite easy to build. Uh, at least uh, a mediocre model is fully automated today, right? Uh, I could use some kind of AI, uh, auto ML technique uh, and build a mediocre model, which is let's say 90%, 95% kind of accurate model uh, extremely quickly uh, in less than maybe a couple of hours or maybe a day if the training data size is, uh, data size is very high. Uh, but how do we qualify which model can go production, which model cannot go production, right? Uh, it's quite tough. Uh, and it may be very, very, uh, 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 very, uh, you know, complex problem as we go forward. So one of the things that you could do is uh, building a layer on top of the models, which is a uh, policy layer. Uh, what it means is instead of using the prediction as is and relying on the predictions only, you could actually have a guardrail around your model. Uh, guardrail is, uh, you know, that could be policy layer uh, that has all the constraints of the business, all the model gap constraints, uh, and data gap uh, constraints. So for example, let's say a uh, very, very simplistic example is Asimov principles, right? Uh, you may have seen iRobot movie, for example, they talked about these three principles, like you cannot harm human, you cannot harm yourself. I think those are some broad three principles. So in short, you can define principles for the models uh, and uh, uh, you can write them as part of the policy. Uh, and uh, whatever the model is, the model could be an XEBM model, deep learning model, or an RL model, doesn't matter. Uh, you can actually make these models adhere to these principles. Uh, it's actually, if, 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 if you have spent enough time on building these principles, uh, then model usage risk can be managed very, very effectively uh, as compared to using the models as is without any of these uh, uh, policy layer on top of the models. So to able to do this policy layer, uh, you have to do stress testing on the model on the process so that you can actually understand uh, the model gaps, right? Uh, where the model is performing fine, what segment, where it's not performing uh, and what happens and what is the reason behind that. So this stress testing can actually give a lot of inputs on building these uh, policy layers. Uh, and this could be the biggest USP uh, going forward uh, from AIML model productionization. Uh, modeling is now democratized, data is largely getting democratized, then the biggest difference is how are you protecting yourself uh, from any given model such that, uh, you know, that protection layer can differentiate between uh, uh, business A versus business B. Uh, so this is going to be really important as we go forward from a model safety standpoint. So NetNet, uh, you know, we have talked about different challenges uh, when we productionize AI, uh, starting off with uh, data drift and model drifts. Uh, and then we talked about fairness and bias. Uh, it's not a one-time event. Uh, it's actually a temporal factor. So you may have to track it uh, in real time uh, in production. Uh, and third was explainability. Uh, explainability has to be uh, 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 you know, understandable by all stakeholders. Uh, fourth was auditability. So you have to develop expertise and tools to ensure that the auditability can be done. 
Uh, and fifth is uh, models can leak data, model safety is uh, another thing. And sixth is actually uh, the policy layer. So uh, is it even if you build something, is it easy to deliver? Maybe not. Uh, again, uh, this is just a starting point. Uh, there are realistic problems. For example, the feedback in some of the use cases could be very coarse. Uh, you can get very, very delayed feedback. Uh, then it becomes quite tough to change or modify these changes uh, in real time. Uh, and second, any explanation is not the right explanation, uh, meaning uh, explanation has to be consistent. Uh, if you're using it for sensitive use cases, it has to be more consistent. I cannot give explanation A at a scenario one for, the, for a case uh, A and explanation B for the same case A uh, in scenario two. So this happens particularly, uh, you know, again, if you use techniques like sharp and line, uh, uh, for sharp basis on the baseline, uh, your explainability changes. For line basis on number of perturbations, your explainability changes, uh, even though the case is still the same. Uh, so you need a, a more uh, accurate and uh, stabilized explainability approaches such that you, you are guaranteed that you are giving same kind of explainability. So uh, in, that's why we are saying that sometimes no explanation is more safer than uh, wrong explanation. Uh, but all in all, all these challenges is what ML observability should actually tackle. Uh, so this is what we believe a good ML observability should uh, have uh, as the components. While ML ops is focusing on model manufacturing, uh, ML observability should focus on model acceptance. So whatever is getting published, how can that be an acceptable uh, 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 to the business, to the user and all of it? So currently, humongous amount of focus on ML ops. Uh, all the horizontal ML ops today are matured enough uh, to be able to help you out to productionize a model in 10 minutes, right? Uh, that's the pitch, right? Uh, uh, we can help you with the model to go live within a day, within a couple of days, uh, all of that. But, uh, 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 but the question is, you know, are all models qualified to go production? That can only be uh, validated and vetted and safe uh, by uh, when you have a good ML observability tool. Um, so this is what uh, we have been focusing on for quite some time uh, because we have first-hand experience of deploying uh, very complex techniques like deep learning in very regulated yeah. industries like... Uh... Hello? Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, yes, but I don't know if it is the case of uh, all uh, for all, but I think you are going fastly. Can you... Uh, <laughs> Uh, sorry. <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, habit of an Indian, but yes. Thank you, so much. Sure, no issues. Yeah, so, um, okay, just redoing the pitch. Uh, what we are seeing is MLOps uh, have democratized uh, model building today, right? Uh, uh, wherein uh, they, it's, it's the manufacturing unit uh, that uh, people have been trying to solve for the last uh, decade, for example. So this is now a solved problem, uh, or at least nearly solved problem. Uh, um, as I said, for most of the mediocre models, it's completely automated. Uh, uh, so beyond that, the technique and uh, the efforts will difference the model performance any which ways. Uh, as the model manufacturing is getting simplified, model acceptance is what people needs to focus on, right? This is where ML observability will come into play. Uh, ML observability can help you to able to keep up with uh, the pace at which the model manufacturing is happening. If you have a good ML observability framework with all the challenges that we discussed being addressed in this ML observability framework, uh, you could actually uh, you know, uh, guarantee a better success of these models uh, in a very safer manner, uh, in a very low risk uh, environment. So ML observability can differentiate those three key variables uh, between a business to business or a use case to use case. Um, and for Aria, uh, uh, we have we have been uh, trying to solve this problem for quite some time uh, because uh, we uh, we have first-hand experience of deploying techniques like deep learning uh, in the banking, financial services, and the insurance industry for almost uh, a decade now. Uh, so uh, we had an opportunity to actually fail very early on uh, because uh, the models were black box, uh, the models were failing, uh, SLA uh, deviations, for example. So we have to keep on building those layers to ensure that uh, we are explainable, acceptable, acceptable by regulators, uh, and uh, we are able to deliver the SLAs. So we build that uh, ML observability component internally for our products, uh, which is what we are now exposing to external users. Uh, so this product is called Aria XAI. It's an ML observability component that sits on top of any ML ops. Um, I know that I've taken some time to do my uh, commercial pitch, but let me take a case study and explain what we have done. 
so we deployed this uh, in uh, uh, use cases like, for example, classic lending use cases. Uh, so there, again, we have a deep learning model which classifies whether there is a default probability or no uh, default probability. Basis on that, uh, we do a uh, uh, credit scoring, right? Uh, while uh, while we have given the model prediction, again, the question was, is this good enough for the user? Uh, next is no. Uh, we have to build this explainability templates, as I call it, uh, as as we discussed earlier. Uh, and in this case, uh, as we had challenges with sharp and line, uh, we couldn't use them. Uh, instead, we actually built our own method called backtrace. Uh, particularly, it's a deep learning specific explainability method. Uh, as as we use very complex architectures, we want to understand it more accurately in a very stable manner. Uh, so we created that uh, uh, explainability method uh, that helps us to understand what's happening inside the network uh, in between the layers. And we use that information and uh, propagate to the features as well. So which is feature importance, for example. Uh, unlike a uh, method like Sharp and Lime, it's a lot more stable. It doesn't change with any of your uh, baseline or perturbations at all. Uh, it uses the model and the inferencing data to give feature importance. Uh, but again, the question was, is this uh, uh, understandable to an underwriter, to a regulator, that's the question. Because even when we did this, uh, many of the stakeholders don't understand uh, this set of information. Next, we looked at uh, another kind of explainability. Um, so for example, one approach that we had was, why don't we do references as explanations? So this is same as prototypes of explanations, for example. So wherein uh, can you explain the model by using prototypes from the training data so that uh, people can correlate this uh, to these prototypes, right? Uh, in our case, we are calling them as uh, references. Uh, as simple as, for example, let's take uh, uh, an LLM uh, as a case study, right? So let's say you have uh, a question like this. And when you ask this question, this is the answer. And these are the references uh, sources where the answer has uh, uh, been derived from. So let's say this is the output of LLM1. And another output for LLM2 uh, is when you ask a question, it gives you a bunch of descriptive uh, answer, but uh, you don't know the references, right? This is an output of LLM2. And LLM3, uh, you have asked a question, there is an answer, and there is a bunch of sources uh, where it is also using from online, from internet, everywhere. So when we have asked uh, uh, you know, this question to a few people, like what do you trust more, uh, particularly for sensitive, uh, 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 you know, uh, very skill set kind of questions, uh, they actually are very comfortable when you give them the references because references gives a validation that uh, the model has used the right source or qualitative source uh, uh, for giving me the answer. So references can be uh, an explainability output. So this is what we have done as well. So what we said is, as we have accurate feature importance, uh, why don't we do uh, a similarity analysis between the inferencing output, uh, inferencing case, uh, and the training data? Uh, thereby, we can actually shortlist the set of cases which are very similar to my inferencing input. Uh, in a very simple terms, uh, we have done a similarity analysis between the current case and the training data such that uh, we can give that uh, uh, set of cases to the user saying that this is a prediction and these were the similar cases from the past where the model has functioned in a similar manner. So probably model would have learned from these uh, similar cases uh, from the past to give you this prediction. And, uh, and upon this, we have done feature importance mapping for all these cases so that the user can see how the feature importance is similar uh, for these uh, references as well. So this is proven to be really powerful explainability for us. Uh, particularly, let's say the model prediction is uh, default, right? Uh, there is a high probability of default. Uh, they can actually look at uh, the similar cases from the past book uh, and uh, find out what are those scenarios uh, and see if those scenarios apply in the current case as well and validate it very, very quickly. So it actually uh, normalizes a lot of knowledge uh, sharing, not only from a model prediction standpoint, but also uh, evidence uh, gathering standpoint. So this was second kind of explainability that we have done. Uh, even after doing these two things, one is accurate uh, feature importance and second is uh, references as explanations. Uh, there were still questions on, you know, what else can we do uh, from uh, an explainability standpoint? So one of the things we learned was uh, if we could give them a correlation between the principles of execution 
the current principles of execution vis-a-vis -vis with uh, the model uh, uh, importance or model correlation, uh, then they can understand it uh, uh, very easily. So what it means is, let's say in any given job function, uh, it could be an underwriting function, doctors, fraud investigation, any of these job functions, uh, they have a principles of execution, right? Like if I'm an underwriter, I would have my own principles or my own knowledge, as you can call it as, uh, on how I would underwrite a case or how I would diagnose as a customer or how I would investigate a transaction, for example. Uh, so uh, what they want to see is, is the model using similar principles uh, in executing a transaction? So it's quite tough to uh, prove that. So, But what we have done in a sneaky way, uh, what we have done is we picked up the principles of the business uh, and listed them out. Uh, so for example, in what are the scenarios where you would look for acceptability, scenarios where you would look for rejections, uh, we asked them to list out all these principles that they would have. Uh, and we started linking these principles with actual data future. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, in this case, uh, you know, so this is one principle where uh, an underwriter says that if there is any public bankruptcy records, and at the same time, currently the FICO score is low, uh, uh, then uh, uh, then they will probably reject the case. So to build this principle, these are the different features uh, that are being used, right? Uh, so what we have done is we linked uh, these features to this principle, uh, and then feature importance is additive in nature, depending upon the explainability that method that we would use. In our case, it's additive, and uh, we, we do have uh, both pertinent positive, pertinent negative kind of contributions as well. So uh, aggregation will give us uh, the final uh, importance of those feature combination anyways. Uh, so uh, when we link these features with uh, the observation, so then we, didn't, uh, then we did a feature importance aggregation such that we can give a total uh, important score for this observation. So then we started ranking these observations uh, based on this score. So for example, if this case comes to the model and if this observation basis on this feature important score is on the top, uh, so you can say that probably this combination of features is actually one of the most important feature for the model to give uh, this prediction. Uh, there could be a lot of other high, high top important features as well, but uh, this is one way to, you can uh, create a correlation between uh, the business principles versus uh, how the model is uh, using those features, for example. So uh, this combination of uh, explainability is actually uh, proven to be really powerful, uh, really acceptable uh, in our case. So this is what we have templatized uh, in ARIA XAI as well. Uh, whenever somebody wants to uh, do an explainability, uh, they have all these components and create an explainability basis on the use case uh, and ensure that the stakeholders involved as part of the explainability uh, and make them uh, understand how the model has uh, functioned. Uh, likewise, uh, from an ML monitoring standpoint, uh, using one uh, statistical method may not be enough because your data and your drift features could be a uh, little different, uh, wherein you may have to use more than uh, one set of uh, uh, one set of metrics uh, to be able to track the data drifts uh, and all. So, in our case, uh, RAXAI provides multiple data drift matrices. So we use multiple matrices from uh, PSI, KL, divergence, and all. Uh, and we do a test uh, 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 test time period. Uh, for example, we use different matrices for six months. We try to find out uh, a closest correlation to model degradation. Uh, and then we use that metrics as our uh, forward-looking metrics. So we will probably start with one, but we have all the uh, remaining matrices that we use to track our data drift. And based on the correlation, we shortlist and uh, pick up uh, that finalized one. Uh, similarly for target drift as well. So we use multiple matrices. Uh, all these are ad hoc uh, in ARIA XAI. So it, it's quite easy for us to create these monitors and then track them uh, and correlate them with uh, model degradation. Uh, now, when it comes to policies actually, so uh, we have categorized these policies into two big buckets. One is uh, model and data specific policies and policy, uh, sorry, process specific uh, policies. So model and data specific policies was once we build a model, uh, we do exhaustive stress testing to figure out the segments where the model performance is good, uh, segments where the model performance is bad, uh, and try to create policies on uh, segments where the model performance is not uh, uh, comfortable uh, and add those policies as an overriding methodology. Uh, and then that couples with the business principles, uh, meaning these areas where uh, uh, model uh, is failure or model is successful, 
uh, the businesses themselves would have different kind of uh, uh, principles like uh, you know they may not want to underwrite certain user uh, they have principles of not accepting a certain case and all so they can uh, add these policies in uh, uh, rexi so we have built a simple gui uh, that we give to the user so that they own uh, the process specific policies uh and we as the model providers uh, we own uh, model specific policies so this is one of the ways uh, that we actually involved the business stakeholders uh, as part of the process and uh, they have uh, a similar ownership on the solution as much as uh, we being the model builders having the ownership uh, so all this is what we have done uh, uh, differently in our use case uh, we have created x minority template used different matrices for monitoring and shortlisted one uh and we create an, an exhaustive policy and also involve the business as part of this so this combination of uh, components actually create a lot of comfort to our customers uh, we tested it actually two three times already uh, uh we have seen that the acceptance was quite quick uh, for example when when we were only uh, uh trying to convince them uh, with a model output we had to do a lot of uh, ad hoc meetings uh multiple meetings uh like saying that you know this, this is my global feature importance this is my uh model uh, uh uh summary for example so we have to give them a lot of knowledge uh, on on those things whereas uh, once we had rexi as this component uh we simply capture all these artifacts uh and all these processes in that one tool and we involved them uh then uh, it became quite quick for us to productionize it monitor it maintain the uh models much much uh, uh, safely Uh, as compared to not having any kind of ml observability uh, framework so having an ml observability could be a biggest differentiator for sure particularly for these regulated industries uh, and as the regulations comes in uh, you know uh, from an auditability standpoint ml observability can ease a lot of things uh, in delivering these uh, auditability requirements um, so next that uh, this is what we have done uh, uh, you know uh, as i said uh, building a model is actually quite easy uh, productionizing it maintaining it and ensuring the consistency is quite hard uh, so this is where production ml ops uh, is gaining a lot of importance uh, with the regulations coming in uh, production ml ops uh, becomes very very important uh, for a model success and model acceptance um, so that's all um, and uh, in fact if you are looking at uh, uh, access to aria xai we are uh, currently in closed beta uh drop me a note uh, i would be happy to share uh, the invitation for it uh, but anyways that, that that's that's all i would want to cover for today uh, happy to take in if you have any questions guys oh yeah um there is a question already so is it useful to be able to export ml models for use on other platforms or versioning of deployed models besides on an export format support models of saving and portability uh yeah so it depends upon what technique you have used and what frameworks uh for example uh, similar frameworks and similar techniques uh, are easily exportable uh unless it's a cross functional uh for example if you build a model on uh, 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 uh pytorch for example uh, and then using a framework uh, 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 a library for building the models you would be storing all of that information in uh, pickle file any which ways um while exporting from pytorch to tensorflow you can use or nx uh, or all these cross functional frameworks uh but i think uh, a simplistic one is uh, having uh, having a same environment uh, in other tool uh, can make uh, model migrations much easier uh, i think that's a more easiest way to do uh, instead of looking at cross uh, cross framework kind of uh, libraries at this point of time um any other questions guys yeah so we have last 5 minutes if you have any questions do let us know um yeah um, i mean a quick question i think how many of you are uh, data scientists or uh, the practitioners oh okay i think this is a very silent audience um but anyways so um 
I think if there are no questions, uh, I don't want to take any more time. Um, so we will, uh, I think the, uh, um, the team will share the recording for this as well. And uh, we will share the deck. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you want to reach out to us, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I can be reached at uh, Vinay at ra .ai. Uh, Yeah, and I think my, my final, final statement would be uh, building a model is easy. Um, and uh, as I said, productionizing the model is actually quite a bit of a talent. Uh, and doing that repetitively scale in a scalable manner with high consistent is an extremely, uh, 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 you know, important talent that uh, the industry needs. Uh, and uh, all these uh, tools could only help us to deliver that going forward. Yeah, I think Pooja has just been, she's a data scientist in Cormont. Yep, nice to meet you guys. Uh, awesome. So uh, thanks guys for taking time. So um, as I said, so we'll share the recordings and uh, let us know and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, guys. It was my nice discussion. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.